Half-Life 2 can't really be considered a stepping stone, more so a big boulder that cannot be missed in terms of the history of gaming. It's both evolutionary and revolutionary, it is a gamer's game. And it's hard to overstate the impact it had on video games as a whole. What do I mean when I say that? Well, let's explore. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on GameRanks we ask the question, what made Half-Life 2 a big deal? Back at E3 2003, Valve was showing off animations of the G-Man as he appeared in Half-Life 2. He was contrasted with his character model from Half-Life 1, and it's not even vaguely comparable. In fact, the pseudo-human being that is the G-Man demo from 2003, and indeed the facial animation from Half-Life 2, honestly kind of holds up now. I've certainly seen games with less good facial animation in the last couple years, but it kind of wowed everyone considering, yeah, there was decent facial animation, there was decent looking characters, but this was like seeing just something completely different. This was next generation gaming. And in truth, really nobody else caught up for a while. There was stuff that looked stylish and interesting, but just that on its own merits stands out massively. When we all saw this, we knew we were in for something big. I think most people saw Half-Life 2 and thought, well, this is going to be something. And it was. Honestly, a lot of people probably will disagree, but I think this game pretty much holds up now. If you chalk up the simplistic stuff that probably wouldn't be done today as stylistic choices, which might I add, there are more than a few games nowadays that actually do chart that same territory looking very similar to what Half-Life 2 looked like on purpose for stylistic reasons. It's a game that I think looks fine. I can play it and go, wow, this is nice looking. And it's old as hell at this point. The trees, the bits of nature juxtaposed with the ruin of man after a disastrous alien invasion that was very clearly lost, you know, by us, just gives us such a clear view of exactly the stakes and how we fit in with this world. It was also because of graphical advancements we had various interesting gameplay advancements, such as the various physics-based gameplay aspects of Half-Life 2. Between the gravity gun being able to pick up saw blades and chop apart humans that have been commandeered by facehuggers, to the various puzzles that we're asked to complete as we attempt to make it further in to this oppressive Eastern European city rendered lovingly with gameplay considerations baked directly into the environment. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. It's a game that doesn't have to do a lot of storytelling to give you a story. I think a lot of us walked away from it with a lot of thoughts. I certainly did, and they didn't jam so much dialogue into my face, although the dialogue that was given to me through different characters talking to me while I walk around, or in some cases in kind of quote-unquote cutscene light situations, diet cutscenes so to speak. What's interesting is you can talk to somebody who has played Half-Life and have them say there wasn't a story. I've had more than a couple of conversations with people who just feel like the environmental storytelling was so subtle that it wasn't really storytelling, but I'd say that that is, if anything, proof that this is such a good environmental storytelling case that it doesn't feel like you're being told a story, it feels like you're in a place living. And I know that some people are going to dispute that. I'm not claiming that I have the definitive opinion on this game whatsoever, but to me, the lore in this game is done so well that it's both a blessing in that it's such an amazing experience and a curse in that everyone thought that just leaving sparse clues was the key. There's good sparse storytelling and there's also bad sparse storytelling. And I think Half-Life does it better. It doesn't try to make it completely clear exactly what happens in every second of every inch of the entire history of the game's world. That's what sparse storytelling is. It's 
sparse. And I'm not gonna tell you that there's one correct way to do that, but I am going to tell you that Half-Life 2 is one of the correct ways to do it because it just feels so lived in and real, or at least as lived in and real as a post-apocalyptic scenario in which aliens have taken over the Earth and you've been asleep for a long time, cryogenically speaking, can feel. And part of the reason all of this was possible was because of a very non-standard development process Valve had developed called the Cabal Process, where a lot of video games are made by breaking all of the employees off into large sound teams, design teams, level design teams, art teams, etc. The Cabal Process breaks the full team down into smaller cabals that fulfill multiple purposes. There's several programmers, several artists, several designers, etc. It's actually a fairly genius way of creating a much more cooperative environment in that designers don't make things that are impossible to build, artists are talking to the people who actually have to make the things they come up with into real objects, and everyone shares a sense of camaraderie that really isn't possible when you view artists as a different class of people or level designers as a different class of people. People you don't talk to, people you don't see during the day. Instead, members of every aspect of the production work together, merging experience and taking full responsibility for the aspects of the game that they are working on. A playtesting cabal helps settle arguments with the various other cabals who may have conflicting visions, ultimately finding ways for people to talk to each other and work through the issues of a creative production process. There's aspects of the cabal process that keep the various creative workers from becoming alienated with each other, as well as giving them more power over the final product. All of these little teams have the same amount of power and responsibility, and their influence is not more or less than anyone else's. Now I'm sure it was imperfect in application, but it's a process that yielded a game that did so much. When I said earlier that gameplay considerations were baked into the environment, what I meant was something you really just can't do without good communication between your design and development aspects of your team, or teams. When you play a level in Half-Life 2, you are playing a masterfully designed, well-paced, not only work of art, but a masterclass in the environment speaking to the player. And while that's certainly important from a narrative perspective, and I am saying that that is part of it, think about the Cabal system and what happens when a level designer speaks with all of the other types of workers on the project. They consider the perspectives of, say, how we get players to go in this direction. If these members of teams were communicating and responsible in the way they were, if it wasn't up to them the decisions made that direct the game, Maybe there would just be arrows pointing at everything, saying, go here. Maybe that's what the programmer thinks would be good, and ultimately maybe that's their prerogative to include it. But what if the art director thinks maybe we can tell people to move in this direction with lighting? Now I'm not saying a more traditional environment doesn't allow people to talk to each other, and people aren't going to design levels that way in a more traditional environment, but the Cabal system specifically encourages these people to communicate with each other, and these sort of cross-category musings, like where an artist might be thinking about how art can affect the design, these thoughts and conversations tend to happen more often and have a more tangible effect on the game itself. A good example of how this distributed power within the structure is a benefit, as members of the Half-Life 2 development team got playtesting, playtesters would often say, why not give the crowbar in the laboratory so you can break a bunch of stuff? But they thought having the moment where Barney drops the crowbar to you was the appropriate time, and if any one person was able to make that call, there's a good chance it would have gone the other way, but they kept it the way it is in the game because there is a build-up and a payoff for the crowbar. And enough people felt strongly about that that even though playtesters had input, ultimately, even though they said, oh, I'd love to beat up the lab, the way they felt was, it's so awesome when you get the crowbar. Playtesters are very valuable, but if everyone's opinion is as valuable, creative decisions can be made that affect the game in positive ways that maybe aren't 
totally explicitly weighted exactly on super open-ended gameplay, which is pretty much what anybody is going to ask for. An example of the kind of decision, the kind of detail, the kind of attention that is just much more encouraged in this way, and I'm not saying it can't happen in the more traditional gameplay production process, but it's encouraged in this one, is something like, you know the hunter? It's got two blue glowing eyes. If you shine a flashlight at it, the pupils contract and expand based on the light. These types of little decisions are the product of more people having more input. Who knows whose idea that was? But somebody thought of it and felt like it was a thing they could express and everyone felt like it was a cool thing to include. And nobody was there to say, no, don't take the time on that. That's what the sort of distributed responsibility model allowed. And it gave us a hell of a game. Half-Life 2 continues to be a great game to this day, one that I still go back to every once in a while. You know, when you just get that hankering for some physics-based, rich environmental storytelling, um, in a single-player game from Valve. Truly a product of a different era, one that I think that not only have we learned a lot from as a culture of consumers and artists, but there's still more to learn from it. Also, it would be nice if there was a third one, Valve. In the comments, let's talk about the best level slash area in Half-Life 2. Let's talk about the best characters, the best enemies, the best devices and weapons. And if you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe, and don't forget to click the notification bell. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.